fun? I think so. Cool. Hi everyone, good afternoon. It is our pleasure to introduce Dr. Sally Thompson, Associate Professor of Surface Hydrology and Shin Distinguished Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. In 2013, she received the Early Career Award in Hydrology from the American Geophysical Union. And in 2016, she received the NSF Career Award um, for her excellence in research and education as junior faculty. Her research is at the forefront of ecohydrology. Um, and from leaf to basin scale in California, as well as South India and Israel. Today, Professor Thompson is going to be speaking about the critical zone, specifically, um, ways we're going to interpret it, interpret the hydrological activity of the critical zone, and mapping out the critical zone soils in the United States. Um, she's originally from Perth, Australia, where she, and she went to School at University of Western Australia where she got a dual degree in both engineering and science, focusing on environmental engineering. Um, she'll be going back to Perth, Australia where she's taken up a position, um, a professorship there. Um, and so if you're interested in doing some work in the Southern Hemisphere, she'd probably be a very good person to talk to. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sally Thompson. Thank you, Mikey and Ava. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, Adrian Harhold, I think in particular, has been asking me to come up for some time, and I've been feeling extremely guilty about not having been able to get to UNR before. So it's just really very nice to be here today. Uh, let me find my clicker before I start getting too excited. Um, so it's always a little bit intimidating when somebody asks you to come and give a talk that involves vision and connects big things in the water sciences. And of course, having been asked to talk about the water sciences, I thought we should start with some subatomic physics, specifically the work of Ernest Rutherford. Now, for those of you who do not remember, Ernest Rutherford is best known for having conceived and then masterminded and steered through a series of experiments starting about 110 years ago that were intended to probe the structure of atoms at the subatomic scale. These experiments were extremely elegant. They involved taking a source of alpha particles, those are radioactive helium nuclei, and firing them at a thin sheet of gold foil. The purpose of this was to get a subatomic particle that was large enough that it would interact with anything that happened to be inside the atom, but was small enough to get in there in the first place. Now, the purpose of doing this was that at the time, there was a proposed structure for the atom. Uh, it was the so-called Thomson model, no relation. And the model really said, we, we're going to think of atoms as if they are a smear of positive charge within which electrons are embedded, kind of like the chocolate chips in a cookie. Had this been the correct model for subatomic structure, these alpha, oops, it these alpha particles really would not have had anything to interact with because this positive charge was thought to just be smeared around and electrons are insubstantial sorts of things. So the hypothesis was that were the Thompson model correct, these particles would be shot straight through the gold foil, would actually not interact with it in particular, and would all appear just on the other side. Of course, that's not what happened. What happened instead was that, well, many of these particles went straight through, but a sizable fraction went bouncing off every which way in all sorts of directions. Kind of like if you'd taken a tennis ball, a bunch of tennis balls, and chucked them at an irregularly shaped object. And it was these observations that led Rutherford and his team to conclude that atoms must have a radically different structure. That instead of being diffuse, smeared out stuff, there had to be a centralized, massive locus in the middle, not taking up much space, but chunky enough that alpha particles could bounce off it. And of course, this is what today we recognize as the protons and the neutrons in the atomic nucleus. Well, why am I starting with this anecdote? Other than the fact that it's very beautiful and elegant science. I've been thinking a lot about Rutherford lately. I've been thinking about this experiment because it seems to me that whether we are engaged in hydrologic science, or more particularly if we are trying to teach people about hydrologic science, we're sort of asking people to take the same leap of the imagination 
that this team of physicists was forced to do. That is, we want to understand the structure and the function of systems that we can never directly observe in action ourselves. For instance, very commonly in a hydrologic setting, we are interested in understanding what it is about the structure of the subsurface of the planet that causes water to behave in the way that it does. And we use all the same sorts of tricks that Rutherford did, except instead of firing helium nuclei at a hill slope, we let it rain. And then we look at a signal, and it's not the bouncing of helium nuclei, it might be the production of flow or the production of a solute time series. And we use this relationship between an input signal and an output signal as a basis for drawing inference and trying to understand something about a place that we really do not directly observe in action. Well, Rutherford was actually extraordinarily lucky compared to the hydrologists of the world because once he'd sorted out what was going on inside the gold atom, he was done with the rest of the periodic table. We, on the other hand, engaged in water science, are faced with a subsurface that has infinite and wondrous variety. This makes it very challenging for us to take our observations in one place and directly extrapolate them to another location. Well, you may say, hang on, Sally, we're directly looking at this subsurface in these road cuts. You know, isn't that better than Rutherford could do? He could shrink himself, he could never shrink himself down to the size of an atom and look at things directly, but we can drive along here and look at these sorts of structures. But yes, we do have that ability, but we're confronted with a different kind of scale problem. We may never have to shrink ourselves down to the size of atoms, but even if we do take a direct look at something happening in the subsurface via a road cut, via a bore, via shallow geophysics, we really struggle to make those observations at the scales on which we would like to make predictions, the policy relevant scales of watersheds and basins and indeed large regions of the globe surface. So what do we know about the subsurface today and why am I bringing this up as a problem? What we're looking at here is a map from the United States Geologic Service from the SERGO Soil Survey dataset. And it's quite an extraordinary map. This is a map of the depth to a impermeable layer across the continental United States. It represents the work of hundreds of soil surveyors. It, it's really an achievement of science. But as you stare at this map a little longer, I hope you'll notice a few things about it that should invite question and commentary. For one thing, apparently, according to Sergo, we do not have soils that exceed a depth of two metres anywhere in the continental United States. Now, of course, this is not truly what Sergo says, but the depth to which these soil surveys were limited is the superficial two metres of, of the ground. And of course, if we are particularly in depositional environments in this continent, that's something of a misrepresentation. Secondly, although this sort of map is very much what goes into an awful lot of our hydrological modelling, we are faced with another problem, which is that it, in using this sort of information as a basis for hydrological modelling, we're implying that the hydrologically relevant parts of the subsurface are confined to the developed soil layer. And of course, that is not the truth. Uh, in recent years, I've had the great joy to work at the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory, which is up here in Northern California, where we find that the hydrologically relevant parts of the subsurface extend 25 metres below the soil surface and are largely comprised of weathered bedrock, which simply doesn't feature in a map like this. So my contention to you would be that although this is a wondrous example of scientific output and effort, it remains substantially incomplete for some of the things that we would like to be able to do as water scientists today. And now I hope to convince you of exactly that statement. So here are three examples about why this subsurface structure should matter and should be something that you are concerned with. The first is, if you are interested in getting your water balance partitioning right, you should care about subsurface structure. What we're looking at on the right of this image is another beautiful example of science, this one produced by Alan and Laurie Flint at the USGS from their basin characterization model. This is a model that is increasingly being used across California and I suspect is making its way into use in Nevada as well. It's a water balance model. It is constrained by climatic inputs coming into basins and flow leaving basins at gauges. And with that constraint and some other information about watersheds, 
Alan and Laurie are able to produce maps like with this one, which make estimates of the average recharge going into groundwater across California. It's very compelling and it's very beautiful, but if you sit down and have a conversation with Alan and Laurie, they will tell you that in some places, this particular map they suspect is substantively incorrect. And the reason that they believe that it is incorrect is precisely because once water gets into the soil surface, it now needs, well, they now know how much comes out as discharge because that's gauged, but the remainder has to be partitioned between recharge and transpiration. And the input that went into the original version of this model, at least, was that Sergo map. Well, in California, where many of the trees have root systems that go at least 10 metres below the ground, if you try to tell them you can only get your water from the top two metres of the soil, you grossly underestimate the transpiration fluxes. So if we care about groundwater and how much water is recharging our aquifers, we want to know something about the subsurface structure and we'd like to do a little bit better than the status quo. Okay, maybe you don't care about recharge. Maybe what you care about is uh, the production of flow during the winter time. Here we have two examples coming from the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory that I hope will convince you that you too should, should care about subsurface structure. Now, here we have two watersheds. One is Elder Creek, one is Dry Creek. These are two sites located approximately five kilometres from each other. They receive almost exactly the same climatic forcing, but they have a very different subsurface structure. Elder Creek is the site I mentioned before, with 25 metres of storage available, mostly in weathered bedrock. Dry Creek is just on the other side of a change in the tectonic history of the land, a change in how much that landscape has been deformed by the uh, North American and Pacific plates grinding against each other. And in Dry Creek, as a consequence, there's only about 30 centimetres of developed soil sitting above a very intact, low porosity bedrock matrix. So with these two very different subsurface structures, we see two very different patterns in the creation of storage and the creation of discharge. What I'd like you to look at are specifically the orange lines on these plots, which are a reconstruction of the fraction of storage in the subsurface that is connected to and is going to be responsible for generating stream flow. At Elder Creek, at the beginning of winter, we see this orange line slowly increasing until we store between 100 and 200 millimetres in total of water in the subsurface. And once we get there, it doesn't change all that much during the remainder of the winter. Slow discharge processes, a large quantity of storage available at the end of the winter season to sustain the perennial flow that we see in Elder Creek and the river to which it is a tributary, the South Fork Hill River, and also water that remains in the subsurface, sustaining what looks very much like wet rainforest conditions on the landscape. Over at Dry Creek, same climate, very different storage dynamics, almost an immediate rise in how much water is stored and an immediate discharge. Very, very flashy. This, by the way, is a logarithmic scale so that when we see these kinds of drops, they're drops of 90% of the storage happening very quickly. And by the end, this isn't even the end of the winter, this is just in early January, but by the time we do get to the end of the winter, there's very little storage that remains in this landscape. We see large flashy floods in this stream. We don't see a perennial channel. We cannot, for instance, rear salmonids in the tributaries that drain this landscape. So if you care about how fast flow leaves landscapes, if you care about whether your river systems are ephemeral, you should care about the subsurface structure. And as a final example, maybe you don't care about any of that stuff, but maybe you care about vegetation. And for some reason in California of late, we have been somewhat preoccupied with the response of vegetation to large variations in climate. Well, if you care about that, if you care about drought mortality, for example, you should care about subsurface structure. This is some work that is currently in review that Jesse Hahn uh, led, which looks at the relationship between how green forests are during summer conditions and how much water fell as rain in the antecedent winter. This is confined to rain-fed watersheds, confined to undisturbed watersheds in California. It's a Mediterranean climate. You all are familiar with that. We would really expect that the level of vegetation productivity we would see in summer should be entirely driven by how much rain fell the preceding winter, and we would therefore anticipate strong correlations between annual EVI, 
a measure of greenness and annual precipitation. And indeed, that's what we see in many of these watersheds. But look at these guys down here. If it's white, it means that there is not, in fact, a statistically significant correlation between the fluctuations in vegetation productivity and antecedent rainfall. Moreover, those white guys are mirrored up here by another set of watersheds where when, we, where when we infer the quantity of total storage in the watershed by the end of the winter, that also appears to be uncorrelated to antecedent precipitation. Yes, Rita Schumer. What's the x-axis? Oh, the, this x-axis, each of these is an individual watershed. Okay. So it's probably better shown as a bar graph, but it's not really a bar. Feel free, to, feel free to give me good suggestions about better ways to plot that. Um, yeah, so each of those is a different watershed showing its correlation over time between winter rainfall, end of winter storage, or winter rainfall and uh, summer EBI. Our inference here is that in these locations where the preceding winter's rainfall does not explain the variability in either storage or in vegetation growth, that this is happening because there is a definable maximum quantity of storage that can be held in that subsurface area. And so it doesn't matter how much rain falls in winter, as long as it's enough to get you over that maximum value. And even if you have, as we did during the 2013-2015 drought, even if you have a halving of precipitation, you may not have vegetation that experiences drought conditions. Again, up in the Ill River Critical Zone Observatory, that's exactly what happened precipitation fell to 50% of its historical average, the plants grew better than usual. Because it didn't change how much water they had, it just changed how much sunlight they got in a normally cloudy place. So if you care about these ecosystems, you should care about subsurface structure. So in having been challenged by Anne to put out some kind of a big idea, this would be my big idea for us today that a challenge that is facing the hydrological sciences community, particularly in the context of thinking about the science of the critical zone, which has really been emerging over the past 10 years, we have to confront the question of how do we open this current black box of our subsurface at the scales that are pertinent to making hydrologic prediction. And I'm going to take us maybe one step in that direction by arguing that key to addressing this challenge is going to be an understanding of vegetation. Let me lay that out for you. Plants are living organisms. They're living organisms with, let's say, 50% of their biomass embedded exactly in this subsurface that we cannot see. We can't see what's going on down there, but you can bet that these plants are experiencing what is going on in that subsurface. The other, let's say, 50% of their biomass is above the soil surface. It's in a location that we can observe. And we can make these observations at multiple scales because plants are ubiquitous. We can get these guys through remote sensing. We can fly aircraft or drones, or we can work at the level of individual trees and think about upscaling approaches. Plants give us, I think, our only distributed sensor of subsurface conditions at large scales. So is it feasible for us to think about using vegetation and its interactions with water as a metric for what's going on in a place that we really care about and we, I hope, now believe is important, but have a lot of difficulty making large-scale observations of. Well, the nice thing about being asked to give a sort of a big picture situation is that you don't necessarily need to have all the answers, so I'm just going to try to take us a few steps down this path today. And I think if we're going to do this, we're going to need a framework. And this would be my tentative framework for how we could start approaching this problem. But firstly, if we're thinking about using plants as sensors, that we have a wide variety of observations that we could make. These could include things like leaf area, they could include the pigmentation in the leaves, which brings us into things that we can see visibly or at various, uh, various parts of the spectrum, but that might also be quite connected to the plant's biogeochemistry. We can look at leaf water contents and potentials, we can measure fluxes at various scales, we can also look at questions like the distributions of particular plant species and where they happen to grow in the landscape, what their spatial pattern is. Lots of different things that potentially have information content that we can work with. We then have a bunch of unknowns. I mean, I've been blithely talking about the subsurface and what we don't know about it, but there's a whole lot of stuff about the subsurface that we might like to know, a bunch of unknowns. These could be 
the soil depth or the total available storage in a profile. This could be a bit more sensible than that, maybe something like a porosity profile with depth. It could be the water retention curve. It could well be a root distribution. We could even say, maybe I don't care too much about the structure of the subsurface, but what I really do care about is how much water is in it. These are all unknowns that it would be nice to try to get at. We also have a bunch of constraints and context that might help us with trying to pull these pieces together. And these could be things like climate and violence, the geologic or the geomorphic setting that we're working within, the types of species we're working with, can we characterise those or classify them in some way? And ultimately, if we're going to take all of those pieces, somehow we're going to need to bring them together, and I don't think there's a way to do that that doesn't involve one or, more likely, many different kinds of models that synthesise things. Well, if we're really lucky, we might find a particular problem where we can take our observations and take our context and our priors, slot a model in and predict our unknowns. That would be really nice. This would be a forward modelling problem. But I think far more generally and far more likely, we're going to find that, oh sorry, I even have an example of a forward modelling problem. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. An example of this might come directly from that work of Jesse's, where we might say, well, given this, if I know what the variability of leaf area is and I know what the variability of precipitation is, maybe I have something as simple as a statistical model that says now I'll predict the maximum storage available in these watersheds. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. However, in general, I think it's much more likely that we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we will have a model available with which we can predict one set of our observations with another set of our observations contingent on knowing the value of some of these unknowns. And that is a more difficult situation and it suggests that we're going to have to think about an inverse modeling problem where our goal is to use what we can see as parameters in a model to explain what we can offer. So in the examples that I give today, I am going to touch on inverse modeling and I'm going to use a couple of technical terms. One is going to be Markov chain Monte Carlo, one is going to be a Kalman filter, and that is about all I am going to say today about those technical terms, partly because I am certainly not an expert inverse modeler, partly because I'm crummy at explaining them, partly because Rita would probably explain it better, and, uh, and I don't think it should be the substance of the talk. So you're going to hear about the use of these things, but I'm not going to go into the technical detail today. We can certainly talk about them afterwards if it's of particular interest to anybody. Um, that's all I'm saying about the technical detail of inverse modeling. What I would like to do is give now just a few examples to, to hopefully indicate that it's possible to get at unknowns in the subsurface by looking at vegetation. And the first example I will look at will be one of these forward modeling examples where we're going to use information about species distributions to try to make predictions of water content. The second example I'll give is an inverse modeling problem where we will look at a uh, observation of vegetation spatial patterns and try to invert a model that would predict those patterns in order to learn something about subsurface conditions. And then I'll very briefly touch on some stuff that's just starting to get going, which I think really speaks more to this idea of plants, the individual plant organism as a potential sensor. But it's highly preliminary and, uh, and you'll really just see some very, very early work. So that's where we're heading. Uh, and of course there'll be some high level faff at the end. Uh, Okie dokie. So, example one, forward modeling using species distributions. This idea is links quite strongly on the notion of the hydrologic niche, which is an idea that's been put forward by a plant biologist, Jonathan Silvertown, and his colleagues, um, mostly working in the UK and in South Africa. And the idea behind the hydrologic niche is that if you are a plant, and I don't think I ever get through a talk without inviting my audience members to pretend that they're plants, so get your role play going on. You're a plant, and you need to live in an environment with variable water content. The notion here is that no matter what the range of water contents to which you are exposed is, they place constraints upon you physiologically. So for example, if you are a plant that lives in very wet locations, as these swamp cypress normally would had the water not been drained out of their lake, you run into strong structural constraints because it's very hard to keep a tree upright in very soggy ground. And I think that's just beautifully illustrated by the carbon investment in these root systems. That's what you have to grow if you're going to be a swamp cypress. That's tough. A cactus, for instance, could not do this. 
but a cactus could grow, conversely, in a very dry environment, where now the constraint that water imposes is upon whether or not gas exchange can be accomplished to enable photosynthesis without the plant drying out. And then the third example that Silvertown and I'll give is that if you're living more in an intermediate environment, it now becomes the variation in redox conditions in the soil that really matters as a constraint for you. Can you fix nitrogen? Can your roots respire? Can you inhabit this intermediate context? So if you buy into this idea, it suggests that different plant species are going to exist in different hydrological conditions, and that therefore potentially you could use the species that are growing in a given location as an indicator for what those conditions are. Now this is not an idea that we came up with independently. Um, I, in fact, I first saw this done really nicely by the work of David Millage, who's now at Durham University in his PhD thesis. And Dave was working in the Lakes District and trying to understand saturation and how it might generate runoff and lead to nutrient export. And what he noticed as he put 95 hand dug wells into his research site was that there was a lot of this rush species, this Juncus suffusus, that was growing around the place. And that's mapped here in red, um, um, down around these stream channels. So with his 95 wells, David was able to say, well, let's have a look at the conditions in terms of the water table depth, which is shown in this left-hand plot, and in the soil saturation above the water table, shown in the right-hand plot, in the watershed at large. And, you know, he finds that on average, the water table is about two metres below the soil surface, and on average, most of the soils are dry. But then he specifically looked at wells where the brushes were growing and found these very distinct hydrologic conditions, it's specifically a high water table and very nearly saturated soils sitting above that water table. That is, the juncus were a pretty decent indicator of where the water table was coming to the surface. They were an indicator of the hydrology. Well, we jumped onto this idea, but since we were in California rather than the Lakes District, we weren't doing something nice like nutrient export. No, we're all about catastrophic wildfire. Um, specifically, we wanted to use this idea in a watershed in the Sierra Nevada known as the Illilouette Creek Basin. And the Illilouette Creek Basin is a really interesting place. It's designated wilderness. So what we're looking at here is President Johnson signing the Wilderness Protection Act back in the 1960s. As the Wilderness Protection Act was coming into full effect, there were also ecologists studying giant sequoia, learning something very interesting about the reproductive biology of giant sequoia. Specifically, that if you wanted more of these iconic trees, they needed flames. They, they require fire in order to open up their cones and release their seed. But seed, so baby, baby sequoia means you need fire. This was happening in the context of nearly 50 years of, man, of very deliberate fire suppression as the predominant forest management strategy. And so, with the Wilderness Protection Act fully in place, biologists at Yosemite and at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park said, we would like, as part of wilderness management, to get fire back into the forest. Consequently, there are two watersheds in the Sierra Nevada that I'm aware of, where there has been a nearly natural fire regime operating for the past 40 years. And that is radically different than the vast majority of the rest of the country where fire has been suppressed and we have very, very different forest conditions. So that's kind of exciting. It got particularly, oh, so here it is. This is uh, California, that's Yosemite, that's Illinois Creek Basin. And, uh, and this is what happened with the history of fire following this decision. Uh, here we have a map showing from 1930 to 1972, lots of little black dots and each of those black dots is an ignition of fire that was subsequently suppressed. Following the decision to allow fires to burn, we see that they started coming in as early as 1973, and that as we added subsequent fires in in the 80s and the early 90s, they formed this beautiful jigsaw-like structure. This is a wonderful thing. This suggests that past fires are inhibiting the spread of the next fire and preventing the kind of catastrophic blazes that we have seen to such terrible effect in recent years. So it's a very exciting, very interesting place. Unsurprisingly, colleagues in fire ecology have been looking at this place very hard. And as they looked at this place, so this transition from kind of the worst example of fire suppressed forests to what we see today, they noticed something really peculiar, which is that they could be walking around at the base of old dead trees where clearly 
a forest had used to stand, and they were up to their ankles in water. This is not something that you commonly experience in a forest in the Sierra Nevada. There's certainly wetland encroachment, but they were finding this all over the place. Large-scale conversion of forest areas into something that looked like a wetland. It implied that the change in vegetation induced by the change in the fire regime was also leading to a change in hydrology, which is really interesting, really interesting. We wanted to try to understand this. But we had a problem. And our problem was that when these folks were putting in a new fire regime and thinking about giant sequoia having babies and so on, they were not thinking about hydrology. There was no baseline monitoring of the hydrological conditions in this watershed that had been undertaken. And indeed, the only time series that we have been able to produce for this watershed is based on aerial photography. Fortunately, that's quite a nice and high resolution record that has enabled us to construct a time series of change in the vegetation cover in the Illawarra Creek going from a nearly continuous patch of forest at the end of that fire suppressed period to a much more fragmented, diverse set of ecosystems that's lost about 20% of its forest cover and replaced that with grasslands, wetlands and shrubs. But this is what we have. So the question becomes, can we use this as a way to get a potential hydrological change? And we've used this in a number of ways, but what I want to show you today is that we thought we could apply the same kind of logic that David Millage had applied in the Lake District to this particular basin. Uh, this is where the Wilderness Protection Act comes back to find you. Um, I don't know if anyone else here has had the experience of working in wilderness areas, but your opportunities for research are quite circumscribed by the need to pr preserve the wilderness character of those basins. So really the only thing we've been able to do here is a lot of very shallow soil moisture measurements uh, in a distributed sense which we've then correlated with some deeper and more continuous measurements of just three locations. But the nice thing about that is that if you're using something like a handheld moisture meter, you can make thousands, and we've made over 9,000 of these measurements. So there's some pluses and some minuses. And with those 9,000 measurements of shallow surface soil moisture, we've been able to confirm that yes, indeed, vegetation does appear to be correlated to the water content in this area. Uh, so these are plots that are so-called violin plots, and the way that you read them is you turn your head on one side and you pretend that 50% of it is a PDF. So it's trying to show the distribution of the water contents. But really the take home message here is that we do see something very different, particularly in the locations that have converted from forest into wet meadows or that have always been wetlands. And there's some differences in the early and the late part of the year. Vegetation appears to be an indicator for hydrologic condition in terms at least of shallow soil moisture. With this in hand, we can then go ahead and say, let's build a forward model. And we use very simple statistical models, multiple linear regression, some machine learning techniques that marginally do better, but they tell a very consistent story, which firstly is that you can do a decent, if imperfect job of predicting of observations of water content, just from knowing about what plants are growing in the location and a bunch of stuff about the topography. Uh, secondly, that by far the most important thing you need to know, and this is a, this is a plot of so-called feature importance from using a machine learning technique. It's kind of like looking at the value of the slope in a regression model. And by far the most important predictor is indeed the vegetation. The performance statistics on this, well, when we, oh, I forgot to turn this around, I'm so sorry, this should read, this should read training, this should read testing. When we fit this thing, it fits very beautifully. When we then test it, it fits somewhat less beautifully, which is not surprising, bit of overfitting going on there. But what I find really incredible is that this sort of performance is about as good, in fact better in some cases, than the kind of retrievals you can get from remote sensing for shallow soil moisture. So I haven't called up NASA and said you should take down your soil moisture monitoring project and just do some vegetation regression instead. But, but it really does suggest that there's a lot of information content just in what plant is growing where that we could be using and is about as good as the state of the art for the same sorts of purposes. So that's, that's how we get a model. Once we have that model, we can play some games. So for instance, we can extrapolate from our observation points and try to make a map of what we think soil moisture might have looked like in this basin in the summer of 2015. With that information in hand and our history of vegetation change, we can ask what kinds of changes in shallow soil moisture might have occurred as a consequence of the change in fire regime. And these tend to point towards, if nothing else, an increase in the heterogeneity of the water content in the basin, with a lot of very minor drying going on in 
large areas and some areas of very concentrated wet path that again seem to be related to the formation of these new wetlands. No processing site going on there, lots of other work to be done, but it does suggest that maybe this is an idea with legs, that we can have a forward model that takes an observation of vegetation cover plus a bunch of, in this case, mostly topographic constraints and predict an unknown, in this case, the shallow water content through space and time. Uh, it's hard to validate this sort of thing, but we find that these results are pretty consistent with the stories that we also tell when we run distributed hydrological models for this basin and are consistent with the overall picture that we get when we attempt to analyse this in terms of changes at a downstream flow gauge. So I'm not going to make strong claims, but I think it's suggestive. Example two. We want to get on to our inverse problem. And in this case, the inverse problem is that you see the reflection of the Eiffel Tower and work out what the Eiffel Tower was. Might not have been the best visual pun going on there. Mm -hmm. um, this example goes right back to my PhD days, and we're going to look at the distribution of vegetation in desert landscapes in a fairly exotic set of circumstances. So these are all images of what is known as self-organized vegetation patterning which is a phenomenon that pops up in dry lands right around the world. Um, what we're looking at in every case is a natural phenomenon. It's not that the folks that live here decided that planting vegetation on the contour was a good idea. It's that very naturally the vegetation has moved through space, organized itself in such a way that it has a regular pattern. And this is a really attractive sort of a target for doing some inverse modeling on. Why would I say it's attractive? Well, firstly, this is clearly a situation where looking at where the plants are growing contains information. If nothing else, there is a directionality and a wavelength sitting there in that image. So these should be information-rich situations. Secondly, what's known about these uh, phenomena is that they're very much driven by eco-hydrological processes. And specifically, the way that we understand these sites is that their areas in dry lands, quite commonly, not universally, but quite commonly develop biologically, biological or physical seal layers or crusts. And these inhibit the infiltration of rainwater. If the water can't get into the soil, instead it flows off across the soil surface. Vegetation canopies do a really good job of preventing those crusts and seals from forming. And furthermore, if you have vegetation there, this is also where you're going to have your insects, your granivorous animals, this is where you're going to have a lot of life, which also tends to disrupt those soil crusts. And consequently, it's not at all unusual that infiltration rates underneath vegetation are 10 to 100 times greater than those in their sites. So all this runoff ends up infiltrating right here, which is great for those plants because that's where they can access the water. And it's like they have their own little private water catchment that supplements the fairly meager inputs of rainfall. Well, that's great. So you're a plant growing and you're getting subsidized with water by water that's running off from upslope. You start to grow bigger. And now you have a problem because, of course, you're now cutting off your own water supply by encroaching into this upslope catchment area. And it's this combination of cooperative or positive feedbacks on plant growth that apply directly beneath the canopy, but inhibiting or competitive interactions at large scales as these, as these patches start to expand that together are thought to cause these landscapes to break up into the patterns that we observe. So that's nice. This suggests that there's something in there that's related to water. A final reason that these are quite attractive for thinking about inverse modeling is that they have been modeled like crazy, particularly from the nonlinear physics community who love a good example of nat natural pattern formation. Um, so most of that work has been associated with arguing that changes in the morphology of these patterns, and this is a pretty idealized set of patterns coming out of Matt Leekirk's model of these systems, that if you look at the change in the shape of these patterns, it might tell you something about whether there's a risk of desertification taking place in these systems. The thinking being that if you get down to having no vegetation at all, you're not going to be able to grow it back too easily because all of these positive feedbacks are in place. So that's nice if we're going to do inverse modeling because we have a smorgasbord of models to choose from. Uh, as you might have gathered, I'm often quite a lazy person, and so I decided to work with the simplest of the models that was out there. Um, I appreciate that you probably, like me, also don't usually call a fourth order partial differential equation a simple model, but you don't need to look at the details of this. 
there's, there's a couple of things to know about this particular model. Uh, one is that it's one dimensional. The second is that it's just a model for the biomass, which is this P term, and it's going to predict that the biomass, if it forms a pattern, forms something that's pretty much sinusoidal with varying wavelengths and amplitudes. So we're going to get a wavy pattern for plants. And the other thing to know about this is it's got three parameters, one of which relates specifically to something that we might care about in the subsurface, namely how extensive horizontally the root system of these plants would be relative to the extent of the canopy. So this is kind of attractive, right? If I now looked at these plants and I said, oh, I know how wide their canopies are, if I can invert this model, and this model is an okay description of the system, then I might know something about how extensive their roots are, something that I otherwise would not know. Okie dokie. So now we're going to do our inverse modeling, and this is sort of how it's going to work. We'll take these observations of the vegetation spatial patterns, we'll have a model that will kick off with some parameters that are pretty much guesses, and it will produce some set of waves. And we take these observations and these predictions and we throw them into this thing called a Kalman filter. We do this multiple times, adjusting the estimates of the parameters until they converge, and we end up with a set of estimated parameters that can explain what we see in the landscape with this model. Okay, well, if you're gonna do this, you wanna test it, particularly if you've got a model already to hand. So we did that, we, we made some synthetic vegetation patterns and we asked, could we recover the parameters that went into them? And here's one example of this, just for that um, L value, that canopy to root length ratio. The real value uh, that went into making patterns in our model was this black line. And we added noise in two different ways, additive, multiplicative noise, with different signal to noise ratios. So over here, we've got our noisiest cases where the pattern's getting really messed up by adding a whole lot of uncertainty. Over here, we had very clean patterns. And what we found was we could do a pretty decent job with this inverse framework of recovering these, uh, these parameters of the model. So then we take it to a real world example. And here we have some false color imagery of a vegetation pattern growing in Niger. And we just take a whole bunch of transects out of this and apply the same approach to estimate the parameters. Now firstly what we find is that this is sort of the first test, we could get numbers out of there. This didn't all just break on us. This made us happy. Secondly, we found that with this, uh, this best estimate, so we just took the, the median value um, of, of L and of the other two parameters, plonked them back into our model, and confirmed that it actually could make patterns. Also not a given, also something that made us happy. But again, this is getting really hard to know if we're doing a decent job or not. And here's where we had some really nice information, which is that a bunch of folks from Oxford came out and did a bunch of field work here and found really tremendously large lateral roof extents, radii of, on the order of 10 meters. And what that implies, if this is an okay estimate for this L parameter, is that these canopies should be about 40 centimeters in diameter. That's too small. It's clearly too small. But we're not estimating that they're four centimeters and we're not estimating that they're 40 meters we're clearly in a reasonable ballpark. And I think given the simplicity of the model, it's a pretty suggestively positive result. Again, very preliminary, lots more that could be done here. So in this example, we have an inverse modeling framework. Our observations now are something quite different. They're a spatial distribution of presence or absence of plants. And our unknown here was a whole bunch of biology stuff, plus the root length. And we get this ballpark accurate retrieval of what's going on here under the ground. But it's a pretty exotic situation, right? So this isn't necessarily the pattern that we see everywhere when we look around, and there's a lot more work to do. So I want to move on to really work that we've got in progress right now, which is starting to get increasingly speculative in terms of having great results to produce. And, and really to think about the idea of using a plant as a sensor of the subsurface which comes back to thinking about what can we really measure at the scale of individual organisms. And here are some things that these days we can measure. We can measure the water potential inside the plant continuously through time using stem cyclones. With drone or aircraft mounted LIDAR or structure from motion, we can have a better view of what the canopy area and canopy morphology looks like than we've really ever had before. We can certainly measure fluxes continuously through time with subflux sensors. And these, these are measuring how fast water's moving in the xylem of the trees and it's proportional to the overall flux from the tree. 
we can also measure the flavour, if you like, of the water that's within these trees using isotopes, so specifically the content or the concentration of oxygen 18 and deuterium. That's a bunch of different things that are all related to each other in the sense that they're all related by the flux of water through the plant, but should be pretty well uncorrelated from each other. They're pretty independent measurements. So could we use these kinds of measurements as a basis for drawing inference? Well, if we're going to do that, we're going to need to face a few challenges. Firstly, we're going to need a model that can synthesize all of those kinds of observations. Secondly, we're going to need to develop methods to invert such models, which is not going to be a trivial thing to do. Then, even if we can do this at the local plant scale, we're going to need to think about how we upscale those kinds of results. And I know that that's a challenge that folks on this campus are very much already engaged with. And finally, if we're, if we're trying to run the gamut from I'm measuring water potentials in plants, but I want to make a prediction about the lithological structure of the subsurface, we're getting into very interdisciplinary terrain not the most interdisciplinary train out there, but we need to have people who can talk soils and geology and geomorphology being able to also talk to people who can talk plant physiology and maybe species distributions. It's not going to be a trivial challenge. So we're making a few baby steps at the moment. Um, in particular, we're starting with a pretty straightforward existing model of the plant water system. And for those who are familiar with those models, this is going to be a super familiar sort of picture for those who aren't. Uh, all this does is say that we have a subsurface that gets rained on, we store water in there, the water ends up with some particular potential, which sets up a series of gradients throughout the tree, and then within the tree there's resistance to flow along those gradients, which is dependent upon the physiology of the tree. And this ends up predicting a flux of evapotranspiration from the canopy. So with a model like that, we might need to make a few improvements. The one we run in my group right now, our subsurface is a bucket. We, we clearly would like to look at some more vertical resolution if we're interested in probing subsurface structure. The model, again, that we run in our group right now assumes that instantaneously these fluxes from the plants adjust to changes in environmental conditions. That's not true for real plants, and particularly if we're going to ask questions about mixing of water within a plant, we need to fix that up. We often run these models with static canopy area. That's going to be problematic over long periods of time. And to the best of my knowledge, none of the really resolved models of plant physiology like this currently track isotopes and link them to the rest of the flux of isotopes in the catchment. So this is one area we're working on. But look, here's a plus. These models do already have the fluxes in them. They do already have the potentials in them. We're starting to get the elements that we might want to bring together. So we're making improvements right now. Um, improving the description of root, up, root uptake, adding isotopes, improving plant physiology, and we hope integrating these into 3D catchment models, uh, mostly in collaboration with a group in Germany. And this is, this is a bit where I embarrass my PhD students, so this is what Jean Wilkins is going to do for her PhD work. We're also 